about this Jimmy Baldwin and how the first thing he did as a trader, yeah. Richard Wright helped him get on, helped him get a little popular. First thing he did was wrote this scathing criticism of Richard Wright, which of course the cracker saw. Oh, we like this. A Negro who right against a black person. Yep. Right. Particularly one that helped him get on. We like this type. Yeah. Yeah. Brought him over to America, made it big, did go tell it on the mountain. Yep. Then did Giovanni's room, some fag cracking up. Yep. Got this freak running around the movement. Then moves in with another fag. Yep. And I guess in the middle of some, what we might consider very strange pillow talk, with some fag cracking that William Styron, tells him, look, why don't you do this for Nat Turner? Why don't you make Nat Turner into a homosexual? Oh. And, and write him from your own perspective. Make, make him like white females and everything. That'll take some of, the, some of the steam out of this black liberation ship. Right. And the fan cracks say, I've been dying to do this anyway. That's a good suggestion. Thanks. And then you got these fags on this side with fags on that side with crackers on the other side all fighting against who? The most progressive people in the black community. Heard one sister out here talking. She said, when I heard about the confessions, I didn't even know the Thomas Gray thing. I picked up the William Styron thing. How can you love Matt Turner and you reading something that was crafted by a fag to make you hate him? That's how evil this Jimmy Baldwin is. And you know, evil, like birds, they flock together. You know, birds of a feather flock together and fags of a feather flock together too. You know, fags of a feather, because fags like feathers. I don't know why, but it's kind of a birdie fag thing, I guess. But uh, this guy here, even though, you know, we make it sound funny, there wasn't nothing funny about this guy you're looking at. Standing with James Baldwin here. His name was Byron Rustin. Now we about to we about to go into something else. This is gonna hurt a lot of people's feelings. But it's time for the truth to come out. It's time for us to deal with the reality. Let's talk about who this individual named Byron Rustin was. Byron Rustin was the individual who ran the so-called civil rights movement. Byron Rustin was a notorious white sex offender who was an open so-called gay black male in the 50s, 60s, and 70s who went around preying on white males to have sex with them, young adolescent white males or young white males and black males and was known for it and was King's main advisor along with Stanley Levinson who was a small hat. Byron Rustin was the one who organized the uh, March on Washington. And you know who Baron Rustin's mentor was? His name was A. Philip Randolph, somebody we taught to love, who was another I just recently found out from a brother who, uh, whose word we trust very much, that A. Philip Randolph was a white sex person. And the puzzle started coming together very good because I said, well, you know, A. Philip Randolph, who was Baron Rustin's mentee, right, right. I said, well, let's go see about the history of A. Philip Randolph. Right. Why is Avery Philip Randolph such a horrible, detestable, low-down Uncle Tom Negro? Yeah. He and another bunch of homicidal Negro cohorts, all trying to destroy the liberation of African people, right. got together, galvanized with small hats and a fag named Gabe Cahoover to have Marcus Garvey deported. Yeah. Sure. Let's go to Race First. This is from Race First by Tony Martin. The notorious letter to Attorney General Harry M. Doherty signed by eight leaders of the Marcus Garvey Must Go campaign, was dated January 15, 1923. These Negroes wrote a damn letter to the damn government. Yep. Though signed by eight, the principal drafters were four, the same four who had provided the initiative and most of the energy for the campaign so far. A. Philip Randolph, Owen, Pickens, and Bagnall. Wow. Look at that. Yeah. I'm wow. yeah. Let's go see what Baron Rustin because I see this is one point I want to make. Barry Rustin was probably, by all accounts, the worst and most egregious yeah. Uncle Tom Negro of the 20th century. Yeah. The moment he came out the womb, he should have been shot. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to show you why. Look at all of the people who he impacted. When you see all of the good African people that he impacted, you'll say the same thing. Should have killed him soon we saw him, but we knew who he was. Yeah, Let's go and see what he has to say about Marcus Garvey. We're talking about a giant. We're talking about a black man that came at a time when black people thought it was horrible to be black. Right. Not that we don't all, uh, uh, some of us don't still feel that way. I'm talking about across the board. If you call somebody black, they will cut you. They might kill you. That was the grounds for fighting. Right. And said, we are beautiful people. We can get up, took sharecroppers, took people who had no hope, yep. changed their lives, right. 
made them know they got business. Got the whole race worldwide together under the assumption that we were one people and that we could galvanize. And while we say, up you mighty race, you can accomplish what you will. That's what he told us, you're a mighty race. He reminded us that while we were building pyramids, these pecker woods were crawling around eating juniper roots in the caves in the hills of Europe. He told us we're better than our enemies. Ahead, We're better than them, but we can do better. Now let's show the world who we are. Right. We were on our way to progress, and these Negroes jumped in. What does he have to say about Marcus Garvey? This is Barry Rustin, his own words. And yet, despite his popularity, Garvey left hardly anything of permanence to the racial struggle. Wow. Mm. And as each passing year brings more progress for blacks within the context of American society, mm. Garvey's nationalist ideas become less and less relevant. What's the black Fortune 500 company, brothers and sisters? What's the name of it? What's the, uh, the, the, the black state that we have in America now? The one that's ruled by black people? What's the totally independent part of Africa that's totally independent, self-sufficient, that has a military ready to go up and defend uh, the, the African people worldwide? And this Negro says, Garvey's nationalist ideas become less and less relevant. This Uncle Tom Negro, you know what, he's dead now, but let's go kill him again. We're going to dig this faggot up. We don't dig faggots up much, but we're going to dig this faggot up and kill him again. Because he sure was killing us. You think that's bad? This fag goes over to Africa during the period when brothers and sisters are doing decolonialism. So they're trying to figure out in Africa right. what strategy should we use to overcome racism and uh, white oppression in Africa. Right, right, right. Well, they figure what better people to talk to than them strong black people that are fighting the crackers over in America. That's right. Let's bring one over and see what they say we should do. Right. They sure got the bottom of the pick of the litter. Yep. This faggot yep. goes over. You see him there with Desmond Tutu. Yep. This fag was actually, but see, that ain't the one that you said, that's not impressing me. What about with them? Who's he meeting with them? Kwame and Kroma of Ghana. Yeah. Yeah. Ezekiwe of Nigeria. Hat boy. Got this fag, a hat boy. Hat boy. Mm -hmm. A fag going throughout Africa telling brothers and sisters, look, don't, don't even think about armed struggle. That's not the way to do it. Just take time and do it. Literally, we got the independence of African people being shaped yep. by a homo who's trying to disenfranchise and demanify is trying to effeminize African people very, very, very successfully. Literally to the point, if it wasn't for a situation that you'll see in a minute why he wasn't able to make it to Nigeria, he went to jail for something, we'll see what it was for, but a minor infraction, I guess, for a homo. But uh, he was in Africa giving advice to the top leadership. In fact, when he was with Kwame Nkrumah, and the book, it talks about how he phoned back to the cracker in the U.S. and said, look, you know, on the surface, it's a nonviolent struggle, but right beneath the surface, right beneath the surface, violence is brewing at any moment. Right. So he's warning the crackers, telling them what the climate and the pulse. He's informing on our people. Right. He's infeminizing us as a race brother. See, this is a monster. monster. He even had debates with Kwame Toure. And of course, our strong soldier here, brother Malcolm X, brother Omar Wally, yeah. when Malcolm made his you know, in very Malcolm X fashion. They started off, he said, let me tell you, brothers and sisters, something. If it's one thing I can't stand more than a black man that loves black women, uh, white women, mm -hmm. is a black man that loves white men. <laughs> <laughs> Malcolm went on to systematically brutalize this fag, of course, on the microphone. <laughs> and uh, I didn't put it up here, but then this, after Malcolm's dead now, right, right. he writes one of the most horrible, scathing criticisms of Malcolm X you can imagine. Yeah. Worse than what he even said about Garvey. Sure did, yeah. Most importantly, though, what we got to talk about, because we're talking about the effeminization. The effeminization is not just about the physical rape of African people. It's about raping you of your idea to defend yourself. Right. Right. Raping us of our feeling of strength and power that we are valuable. And that anything that would try to harm us should die or should be harmed, that we have the right to conquer. We lost that. We have the right to be on top. We have the right to rule. We have the right to defend ourselves. We even have the right to be offensive if we think something would harm us. God gave us that right. We're the first people on planet Earth. God didn't want us to have it. We wouldn't have been here first. But through the process of effeminization, they can strip all that from you. Let's go see. We see Martin Luther King here. We talked about 
bed resting. Let's go see, and I'm going to just say this before we watch it. I got to say this, and it's the truth. The fact is, I'm going to say it straight. Martin Luther King Jr. is going to have to go down in history as an egregious Uncle Tom Negro and a traitor to his race. Yeah, That's what the record will show. We'll watch it. You can't say that. We'll watch it. But I will say this in his defense, and I shouldn't be defending an Uncle Tom Negro. There was a man in Martin Luther King. There was remnants of manhood that you could see. But somebody figured out a process by which to strip the manhood out of African people. So he's going to have to be remembered as an Uncle Tom Negro, but brothers and sisters, now we're going to start to really see that if feminization goes far beyond just the rape and the so-called homosexuality, that it's a process of homosexualizing or feminizing the entire race. So let's go out to this, brothers and sisters. Let's first start off by just seeing some of the characteristics and learning about the character of this Brian Rustin since for many of us, he's a figure that we're not familiar with. Let's get a little familiar with him. We ready back there? I am not ready to die. I want no Negro to die. I want no human being to die or to be brutalized because I thoroughly believe that this struggle can be won without brutalization. In every community, a group of angelic troublemakers. <laughs> The only weapon we have is our bodies, and we need to tuck them in places so wheels don't turn. When I was 20, I happened to go to a conference at Bryn Mawr College on the subject of race because there was a man who was going to speak there who was extraordinarily uh, brilliant and uh, fascinating speaker. Byron appeared on the scene, and for some reason, he looked in my direction, and I looked in his direction, and something happened. We <laughs> so determined to stay in touch with each other. There was no question that I saw him as my lover, and, and he saw me as his lover. And uh, it was clear that our letters could not express clearly what we felt. So we developed a code, and I would write about myself as a woman. One of the first people who openly accepted homosexuality, he didn't hide it. And that is the greatest quality of my wrestling. What? FBI Field Report. On January 21st, 1953, Rustin was arrested by the police department in Pasadena, California as a suspected sexual pervert. He was charged with lewd vagrancy and sentenced to 60 days in the county jail. That was pretty fast news through the pacifist community that Bayard had been arrested in Pasadena. All the other arrests he'd had were on grounds of principle. But this was an arrest where he knew he was wrong. I don't mean morally wrong because it was a sexual encounter. I mean it was stupid to get arrested on the backseat of a car with two guys in a public place. So he knew this. Is there anyone, anyone in the room unclear as to whether or not Barry Rustin was a white sex offender? Uh, is there anyone in the room who actually believes the possibility exists that someone in the black community that was uh, a leader in the community with a man who has an arrest record for sleeping in the backseat of the car with two young white males that they might not have known he was a white sex offender? Anybody believe with the Indian, and they was an Indian, the Indian said the greatest quality of Barry Rustin is that he was proud to be a so-called homosexual. So let me just say it definitively. 
everybody knew he's a white sex offender. Everybody around him, that was part of what, that's part of his whole personality. You just saw it, I don't have to show you no further. No, no, no. And just, without going deep into it, uh, this depth, that was just a inkling. When you go into the research on him, you have no idea. He was so bad that Crackers was calling up the cracker who was leading this organization saying, listen, this guy is corrupting our children. He slept with so many of our sons, you have to do something about it. He's turning heterosexual white males into, Crackers was calling, right. saying that this was a problem. Right. So now we gotta understand, I know it's sick, but now let's watch what happens when you have a white sex offender with a feminine uh, position who respects and cherishes white authority, and now they come to someone who's trying to figure out what they're gonna do on behalf of black people and they begin to effeminate. Let's watch the effeminization process take place. Y'all ready? Right. Let's watch it. Because he was gay, he wasn't able to be front and center in the civil rights movement, even though he was really one of the main brains behind the civil rights movement. He was a man who went and spoke to Dr. King about the idea of violence versus nonviolence. He taught King how to do nonviolent direct action. And I think if he hadn't been gay, he would be a household name today the way Martin Luther King is. He was the force behind the March in Washington. When anyone sees that footage, pictures of Dr. King or Avril Randolph, you know that the man behind one of the greatest speeches that's ever been delivered was Brian Luther. Hey, Very few people can aspire to Martin Luther King or Mahatma Gandhi. But if I Russell, maybe we can aspire to be somewhat like him. We were depending on moral and spiritual forces, using the method of passive resistance. I had a gun down to Montgomery to give Martin Luther King invaluable advice about the mechanics of how to conduct an unviolent campaign. So in terms of practical, political agitation and organization, I had offered that. When I arrived in Montgomery, Dr. King had very limited notions about how nonviolent protests should be carried out. When I first got there, the leadership had Dr. King's home protected day and night by men not only with shotguns, but with pistols. Watch the feminization. King had guns. I'm here to see Dr. King. Nelson, who is it? Good evening, Mrs. King. Bye, Rustin. Bye, Rustin. Well, the bride Rustin is here, and I guess we've arrived. <laughs> Dr. King. You'll be blunt. You're straying from the principles of nonviolence. You know what? Like, you're the leader of a nonviolent movement. And yet you have guns in your home and these armed guards outside. Let me ask you something, Mr. Rustin. Would you risk your family for a tactic? Nonviolence is not a tactic. Would you risk your no, nonviolence as an ideology? I have it's an obligation to protect my family and defend the nation. Well, the guns don't make me feel any safer. The feminization, the war. Byrd was to him like an older brother. Martin Luther King was 25 years old. <laughs> and he didn't have the history and the experience that Byrd shared with him was somebody that could talk with him on his own intellectual level, think through the political and social and moral dilemmas. Rustin, Rayburn went to Adam Clayton Powell yes, and told Adam to get Byron out. Right. Powell then made a speech in which he said to the press that there were immoral elements working in the civil rights movement. That message was clear. It was aimed at Byron as the immoral element. You called that a brother? No! Listen, Clayton Powell didn't want blacks picketing the Democratic Convention. In fact, he went so far as to warn King that if King did not withdraw his support from that demonstration, he would go to the press and say there was a sexual affair going on between me and King. Martin was so terrified by this threat that he decided he would get rid of me. He... As more people became involved in the march, the march tenor became less and less radical. That's radical. Those of us sitting in the march on Washington office in New York, every time he came back and said, we're not going to march around the White House, or 
the leaders were going to meet with the president before the march or after the march, the time was changed so it would be less protesting, we'd all say, oh, Byron, they're turning this into just a circus. It's not going to be a real protest. And Byron was sort of look at us just wait. I now bring to you the executive director of the March on Washington, the man who organized this whole thing, Mr. Bayard Rustin. so-called white sex offender, as a white sex offender, so-called homosexual, is enough to discredit him. Okay. Say he's not worth it. But you know what? I, at this point, I'm not even going to focus on Brad Rustin. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about some evil. And we got to dethrone this individual because he wasn't put here by black people. Mm -hmm. I got to talk about Martin Luther King Jr. for a minute. Mm -hmm. Listen, mm -hmm. brothers and sisters, I don't trust the Ku Klux Klan. You know that. Mm -hmm. right. You don't have to ask me that. Right. We know that our people don't trust the Ku Klux Klan. Right. If I want to get somewhere, and I trust you to take me. It is evil for you to know that you're following the claim and not tell me, knowing that I'm following you. Right, right. Give me the option right, right, that's right, right. of knowing who I'm following. Right. If Martin was following a homo, which you see, it was clear that he was following the homo. Right. I mean, so much documentation where he called up and asked, we went through it yesterday, asking him what to do. If you're following a homo, Martin, and you know that your race, you know how your race feels about white sex. Right. Right. And you choose not to inform your race that you're following a white sex offender. It means that you're asking, you're telling your race, follow me, but you're not in leadership. Right. And really, we right. follow the homo. Right. Right. See, it's one thing to look at Martin Luther King and say he looks kind of like a man, like he has some strength, and to hear him tell you to lay your body down in the street. And you say, well, maybe I'll do that. He's a man, he looks like a man, he, and he said maybe it makes sense, I trust him. Right. It's another thing if he gets out the way and says, this homo right here is sleeping with all these fat crackers. Right. He wants you to lay your body in the street. You say, well, I'm not going to do what a homo want me to do anyway. Right. 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 Mm -hmm. So it was evil right. for Martin Luther King. He is a traitor to his race. He knew Bear Rest in one conversation. At the uh, march, he looked over somebody he was talking to and said, um, yeah, the march will go good. As long as we make sure we keep Barrett away from them young guys. Mm -hmm. So he was perfectly familiar. Yeah, yeah that's what he said. Yeah, he, he was totally familiar with what Barrett was doing. You see, you see Adam Clayton Powell had to go to, uh, to the last time. And we don't know if the actual physical effeminization of Martin Luther King was real. We don't know what he did when they were at hotels together. Because right. they traveled the country together and yeah. stayed in the same hotel. Right. Sometimes the same room, shared rooms. But we don't know what happened. But it really don't matter. I don't know what happened. Because what we do know is that we saw him with guns in his house to protect his family against bombs. And we saw 
the feminization process occurred when somebody talked a black man out of having guns inside and outside of his home to protect his family. We gotta get rid of these damn fags. We gotta get rid of this white sex. They are destroying us. They're very corrupt. That's why I say the down low, it's all down low. The fag don't never tell you, I'm the fag. I'm the fag here to say, I'm a fag, this is what I do. No, it don't work that way. You get caught up in the person, Naeem, telling you visions for black men, you read all some positive stuff, but you don't know where he really leads. You don't know that Naeem is like a, a central beast, but he got sales all across the country. Right. Individuals that Naeem has uh, studied under him, these homos, they principals around the country, they end African nationalist organization, they starting up some of these bell beating water sprinkling organizations, right. talking about African spirituality, you got people associated with doing this, uh, these priestesses, uh, priesthoods from Africa, all kind of stuff. Uh, a Union Temple Baptist Church, Willie Wilson being feminized, these fags are literally coming in, finding people who are unsuspecting, and trading off sexual deviance and death for our people, trading that off when we're really supposed to be fighting against white authority.